I think more and more people feel the equation of working to pay for a house that you cannot spend any time in because you have to work so hard is not good anymore. Living debt-free is possibly the best thing we've ever done. We've become mortgage slaves running the never-ending rat race to pay for expensive and increasingly unaffordable shelter. In addition, many people cannot afford a home and homelessness is growing. Government housing programs give handouts rather than hand-ups and these keep poorer people trapped rather than empowering them. There are solutions that are available to young and old that are extremely affordable, that are green and kind to our planet and our health. But there's also a stumbling block. I had no money and I had the freedom to build. Well, the original intention was to put enough cob houses out into the US that it would change people's vision of what was possible. That's all. Because at that time, there were no other options than to build a stud frame house. There wasn't anywhere that demonstrated houses made of anything else. It was illegal in most places to use other building materials than those which enrich the corporations that supply lumber, um, cement, plastics, glass, electrical wiring, and so on. It's been 25 years, and that's how it still is in a lot of places. I get a letter saying, um, that they want to inspect my whole property. At that point, I knew that my life would change forever. Inspectors came, cameras taking millions of pictures and not talking very much. My life was in so much stress that I could not sleep anymore. Literally, I, I stopped sleeping. I was a zombie. I was scared. So two months later, I get the next letter. They gave me like, I think it was like three months in which to legalize that cob house and then deal with this little one. Basically this one is only 80 square feet. Well it happened that one inspector, if it wasn't for this one inspector who brought it up, he goes, well you know what, according to the code, even if she doesn't need a permit, she still needs to build it to code. So she's going to have to engineer it like the other one or cut the walls down to four feet high and take the roof off and we'll accept that. Or she can keep the roof on and cut the walls down to three feet high and we'll accept that. And we'll call it a gazebo. I went through three engineers. It's the first one that I hired. And what he did was he looked at the New Zealand building code and followed that code. So they did not like that. They said, this is not enough. At that point, I went to an Egyptian guy who grew up with Cobb, the city. Basically, they didn't see how his solution would help. So, um, I was about to give up, and then I imagined myself taking a big, like, pickaxe to the Cobb wall, and I'm like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I built this thing with my heart and soul. I talked to an engineer in Santa Cruz, and I said, what is it going to take for us to legalize that thing? So he uh, went to talk to the city engineer made a rough sketch of his idea, which was wrapping the whole building inside and out with a 14 gauge wire mesh, drilling 300 holes through the walls to slip wire through to attach the mesh to each other so they're tight, opening up the floor, two feet of my floor from the wall and then two feet from the outside digging two feet down, so my beautiful floor ruined, um, drilling every two feet holes for um, rebar, what do you call them, dowels, every two feet 
all, the, all around the inside and all around the outside, okay, which is 50 holes. Pour new concrete, attach it to the existing foundation, which was rock and mortar, cover the rock and mortar with the concrete so you don't see the rock and mortar, and then attach the mesh at the top to the uh, blocking under the roof, and then replaster the whole thing with a lime plaster. It was a nightmare. I cried almost every day going like, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can finish this. As an architect, my father started out doing you know, traditional structures. And, and so when he went on this path and began doing the earth architecture, he, he went for a while and just did his own projects, but then he realized that he had to go to the building department. He had to get permission, that he didn't want to just stay on the fringe, that he didn't want to just have this architecture that was dismissed because it wasn't going through the direct paths. And although, you know, some of that is definitely bureaucracy, and, and he knew that, he still wanted to make sure that for the people who were ultimately going to be building these structures, that he set the course for them. Every person that goes through the building permit process with a Cobb building henceforth is benefiting every person after them that goes through the building department. I've been involved with Straw Bell building codes for 14 years and was lead author of the Straw Bell appendix in the Inter International Residential Code which is the model code for virtually every jurisdiction in the United States and that's extremely important for many reasons. So the Straw Bale Code, the, the, the men and women who've been working on getting that code um, officially accepted have worked very hard for very long and it's there. And I think that that's going to open doors for people who want to build earth ships, for people who want to build cob structures, for people who want to build wattle and daub or, or straw slip, I mean all of that stuff. Doors may be opening for natural materials, but in the Western world, building skills aren't passed from one generation to the next, and that's problematic because skills you aren't exposed to and don't use, you lose. I came to natural building out of conventional construction. So for me, I have a background where I understand construction first, and then I expanded it out into natural building. If you learn from someone who doesn't really understand how to build, you're not going to build well. Um, and, and the importance of codes really come into play then because the, the code officials will say, well, you 100% cannot do that because that will collapse. And that's going to be great, especially if you don't know. If, if this is what you were told how to do it, uh, that's, that's helpful. There are, you know, and the, certainly there are people who are sort of launching in natural building projects because the complexity is so much lower. And people are getting a great start and they're doing some amazing things, but there are some people who are still falling short of <laughs> uh, sort of those minimum requirements that I think would make sense. With the internet now, images can travel really fast. So if there's a story about a collapsed house or a failing house or you know a cob house where the, the rain hit it and the walls are washing away, that becomes a major issue for the rest of us who are trying to move this forward. It's like uh, the cyclist who runs a red light. Um, you know, people look at that cyclist and say, oh, cyclists are bad, they don't follow traffic rules, all cyclists are bad, like get them off the road sort of thing. And this is sort of this blanket statement. Instead of looking at them and saying, oh, there's somebody who's, there's one member of a community who's made a poor choice. But that's, it's not quite a liberty that we can afford with when we're trying to advocate for uh, a change in the system. Well, the function of, of, of permits and codes uh, are to ensure that buildings meet a certain standard. So building codes started 
around the subject of building safety, largely around the fact that a lot of buildings were burning down. They were built tightly in cities, they were constructed of wood. We didn't have the kind of water infrastructure that we have now, so a lot of buildings burned down. So there was a big interest in life safety and in just not having that be a repeating pattern. The more information we have about Cobb, the easier it's going to be to get it through any kind of building code process. I think it's very important to be open about all of your successes and failures. The lessons you learn through that process can help the folks in line after you. And looking at buildings that have been constructed over the, the history of Cobb is important too, to really understand the material. So it's, a, it's mostly about understanding, and that understanding comes from field experience, but also testing. There is control within building codes about materials that are used for construction. There is a chain of, of commercialism that is related to those materials. And through that, there's control, there are standards that are used to determine the quality of materials and whether they're suitable for building. And to some degree, that's appropriate but there are materials that are in their natural state that also can be uh, suitable for building. I think there's a bias built in against that. Now, it's been said by some in the sustainability community that wood, meaning lumber, would not be an approved material under the codes if uh, if it were trying to get approved in today's world because there is tremendous variability in wood. No two trees are the same, right? And it's got grain and knots. And, and so um, uh, fortunately for those who like to build with wood, wood was pre-approved long before the codes were developed which is probably the only reason that, that, that they're in the codes. How do you know when you've got a good clay mix? You know, clay is different everywhere. It's what you find. And so you're working with local clay in every situation. So the mix is a little bit different. Tremendous variability in the soil composition. And so it makes it very challenging to use the codes to prescriptively tell you how to do it. The only way really to get there and get an approval is through engineering analysis. So it's a much more onerous path. It's very difficult to make a proprietary product out of clay and therefore I feel that it has the possibility of remaining as a building material for the people for some time. It's a material that its base can be found below your feet almost anywhere you choose to build and that's a benefit that uh, most of the world can take part in. But now if you try to use uh, clay or soil from your site uh, as in some sort of an earthen structure, now from a sustainability standpoint it's great from a code or from a regulatory perspective very very challenging because we like things that are manufactured product it's got a listing show us the listing yep no problem we can accept that okay. it's kind of square peg square hole round peg round hole and when you bring us something that is a very different shape then that's challenging for us I had an interesting experience in my work with straw bale building codes at a public hearing where a gentleman from one of the wood industry associations testified in opposition to the straw bale building proposal uh, claiming that no straw bale was the same as another straw bale each one was different and 
The, one of the committee members at the hearing said to the opponent of straw bale building, knowing that he was from one of the wood products associations, isn't it true that every piece of wood is different from another piece of wood? And that person was simply silent. Sadly, testing of natural building materials is no easy feat. The other solution, which is one that I'm somewhat reluctantly involved in myself, is trying to change the legal structure so that there are codes that exist for Cobb and other natural building systems. And, and, and the reason I say somewhat reluctantly is that this is a very lengthy and expensive process. It seems somehow kind of ironic to be to be embarking on this adventure which is probably going to require many millions of dollars, enormous amounts of technical equipment, um, lots of engineers to, to enable people to build in this way that is so inexpensive and so simple and so non-technical. So he would go month after month to the building department and try and convince them to come and, and test his structures, to do the seismic testing, and they dismissed him over and over and over again. Finally, he said, look, I'll be back. You know, please don't, don't think that this is just a, a short-term thing. I'm going to show you that these buildings are really something. Uh, and he managed to get a grant at the time, and he hired a private testing company to come and do the entire set of seismic tests on the structures, and was able to prove, you know, took those numbers to the building department, and was able to prove to them that the tests began to fail, that the equipment couldn't handle the strength of the building. And those building officials came back and actually told CNN and BBC and Reuters that this is something, that this is a solution, this is something to keep our eye on because, you know, the numbers show and the testing has shown that this is a true solution, that it is very seismically safe and that we need to consider this as an option. The testing process is onerous. It's very, very expensive. And in order to get a product approved for a certain use, that the interest that's advancing this product has to have tremendous resources. And these days, you know, as we know with some, with some materials, not just to have the materials to have it tested for that performance, but also the political clout to, to affect the decision making um, that leads to the legalization. So just the sheer fact of testing requiring resources means that certain interests will tend to be able to advance their, their cause. There is no Portland Cement Association or other organization that has a lot of proprietary wealth in the product and is uh, putting a lot of that wealth back into research. The manufacturer is the, is the one who's sort of pushing the code because they want their product to be sold and to be used. So they're the, the big timber organizations and the, those folks, they're the people who are doing the testing and the, the structural analysis and saying, this is how much of wood you have to use to build a house so we can sell it all to you. The newer codes kind of prescribe specifically uh, how you achieve that, right? And more often than not, those prescriptions require some sort of manufactured products. Current building codes basically mandate new materials, and it's very difficult to sort of build using recycled materials. And one of the strategies to keep cost down of an owner builder home is to use as many recycled materials as possible and it's also a, a sustainability and environmental strategy to do that. We did use a lot of recycling material in, uh, in both, the, both the structures that we, um, that we have here and that of course is very user friendly, it's very environmentally friendly. We, we, and it's nothing, nothing was wrong with that wood at all. Uh, we, you know, we got windows that, that were recycled. Uh, Kate even found a bay window on the side of the, side of the highway, which <laughs> turned into be a, a roof of the landing for the front door. And, you know, so you can get creative with these materials, which, you know, when you're working with normal building materials, there's such a, a linear thinking. Building green and for energy efficiency are important, but new laws make compliance even more complicated than it ever was before. 
a natural building is really much more interested in simplification, minimizing impact, um, minimizing cost, and, and frankly maximizing your affinity with your own environment. And so ideas and technologies that are accessible enough for anyone to be able to do for themselves, which is not true of what these standards require. They require specialists, you know, mostly industrially manufactured goods and services and processes that only specialists and professionals can do because they're trained in certain ways and they have to be licensed and bonded in certain ways. One of the things that happens with that uh, shift towards the sort of the, the lead homes or the green homes is that in order to um, in order to sort of meet those criteria you get roped into purchasing more and more complicated or expensive systems you know it used to be that if you wanted some fresh air in your house you just sort of like open the window a little bit but now you can't do that because that's bridging the sort of building envelope and so what we need is we need to have a fresh air supply system but we can't do that because we have to have a heat recovery system so now we have to have a heat recovery ventilator we have to have all this ducting we have to have like thermostats and fans and you know all of this sort of complexity in order so we can have like lovely fresh air in this you know in a home well much of that has to do with the fact that like we're looking at homes that are far too big and far too complicated and if you get back down to like a simple home that's small, then cracking a window or op you know opening the door for a couple minutes and you know that that's that's okay because it's not you know sure we're losing some energy but the amount of energy that we lose is so little compared to sort of like the cost and the complexity and the energy that's invested in a heat pump and a heat, re and a heat recovery ventilator. So there's so there nothing you can do to make a home more sustainable than making, making it small. It small. I think one of the impacts of us living in smaller houses as opposed to huge Mac mansions is again some respect for the earth that we just can't power our way through everything that we can learn to live in peace and more harmony with with the earth. People's perception of what a house is and what they need is based on what they see around them and how they see the other people around them living. And in the United States particularly, we've gotten on this insane treadmill of increasing creature comforts, increasing gadgetry, um, and also increasing house size, which, you know, we see that stuff around us and it becomes normal, you know. Everybody on the street has a 3,000 square foot house, so that's what a house is. Everybody on this, everybody I know has an air conditioner, so that's what I need. And what's absolutely necessary in this time in history is questioning those inherited belief systems. And, and getting back to basics and thinking, really, no, actually, what, really, what do I need? I mean, part of the, the, the detail and the complexity of modern code is because modern buildings have become so sort of much more complicated. This code here um, from the 1950s, um, how it has evolved into this set of codes here, is uh, obviously drives the cost up. The scary thing is that if we were to look at this or think about this on a graph, right, with uh, complexity over time, then we see that the it's it's an upward curve, right. So what I notice is that the rate of change or the rate of increased complexity is accelerating as we move forward over time. So when I try to extrapolate that forward and just think, well, okay, what does that mean? Um, it's hard to envision, honestly, what that means, but whatever it means, it isn't good. It can significantly complicate the building beyond reasonable safety precautions. Many of the codes that we enforce intuitively seem uh, to be um, 
unreasonable, excessive, and, and yet we're stuck having to enforce them. I think especially for small homes, some of the energy efficiency requirements that make a lot of sense if you're looking at a 2,000 or 3,000 square foot home, like if, if that size, you have to make sure that you are just as energy efficient as possible to not just be wasting huge amounts of electricity or petroleum to sort of heat the place. And if you're looking at a home that's, that's um, you know, 400 square feet or 200 square feet, you can sort of get away with a little less restrictive requirements for materials. I mean, I'm currently living in a 200 square foot straw bale studio. It's very well insulated. Most of my heat comes from a 250 watt heat lamp. Like that's like, you know, it's small. So I don't need a lot of heat. <laughs> I think the small owner built approach is uh, really lends itself to supporting the pursuit of more sustainable ways of living. Some jurisdictions will, will say you have to have a 700 or a thousand square foot home. Well, what if you don't want to build that? What if you can't afford to build that? What if you can afford to build a 400 square foot home? And that's what you're really after. They're going to say no. There's a dilemma where there should be some sort of a, um, in the code, it'd be great if there was some sort of a, a exemption for some of that sort of energy efficiency um, when you're for, for sort of a small, for smaller home. There should be some sort of like cap at like, okay, it, it could be heat per square foot or heat per person, so to which everyone is lower. Building codes vary from one area to another to take natural disasters into account. It's so interesting to me that earthquake is the first thing people talk about in California, which happens once in a while, but fires burn every year in California, and thousands of houses burn down every year in California, and no one's talking about non-burnable materials to build your house with. It just doesn't make sense. People would often ask my father, why have you come here in the middle of the Mojave Desert to, to do your research? You know, this is such a strange place. It's, it's in the middle of nowhere. And he said, what do you mean this is the perfect place for research? They said, how? He said, well, we have flash floods. We have extreme heat in the summers. We have snow in the winters. We're at high elevation and we're right by the San Andreas Fault. How else can I possibly test a building other than in this way? He would say that the only sustainable thing, that we talk about sustainability, but he said the only sustainable thing is the earthquake, is the tornado, is the hurricane. It will be back over and over and over again. You can guarantee it will come back. Well, why is it that we just go back and rebuild again the same thing that used to be there that got destroyed? Why do we keep doing that when we know the outcome? You know, do, do we forget that quickly that the outcome is going to continue to be the same? One of the limitations of modern materials and building codes is that the materials that are sort of available and or prescribed are toxic. And the modern homes, as we start looking at health impacts and sort of the fire life sort of safety issues of modern homes, uh, we need to start looking at sort of the toxicity of modern homes as, as a very real um, problem. Like why are cancer rates sort of skyrocketing? Um, is could it be because, in part, we are surrounded by um, carpets that are made from plastic, furniture that's made from plastic, um, wood that's got formaldehyde based glues in it, like all of these sorts of, uh, you know, things that are lead-based paints, um, things that have like flame retardants in them. These are all things that are sort of off-gassing and coming out into the air of the home. And that sort of toxicity has got to be uh, poisonous and hazardous to, to the human life. It's everything that I do want to be breathing and living in and looking at and touching. I think that the, the, the change in um, sort of vision of sustainability like that needs to happen sort of in building codes is that rather than looking at sort of just the safety of the, the building, like will the building fall down or will the building burn, like those sorts of, will the water harm the occupants? to looking at um, how the sort of construction process of that building impacts the, the safety of the environment as a whole. Building codes, although they were originated for, I think, good reasons, and I think there can be some good reasons for building regulations, the way that that system 
of control has evolved in our cultures is one that significantly disempowers people from being able to meet their own housing needs in a couple of different ways, at least three different ways. Uh, one is it makes a house more expensive because in addition to building your own home, you're having to pay for the existence of this bureaucracy that's there to regulate house building. Second, codes and other regulations in many communities, for example, require minimum sizes to houses. So you can't just build yourself a little hut and live in it legally. Fortunately, there is basically two paths in the code. One is prescriptive that tells you how you must do things assuming that your intelligence won't be engaged. Then there's the performance path. But the performance path, while it has the virtue of, of enabling you to create an innovative approach to something, it also requires you to have specialists involved that can calculate values and efficiencies um, that you wouldn't be able to prove yourself unless you were very knowledgeable. I think that with all the associated costs, related to permits and basically design costs, engineering costs. Um, you're looking at probably 10% to 20% of the overall cost of a house. When I um, started to look to uh, build my first home, um, the, I looked, I was in, living in the city and I looked at sort of what would it cost to sort of take a, a bare lot and get the permits and um, run the utilities and um, sort of fit into the sort of the conventional system. And um, the number for that was close to $30,000 and that was in like 2000. And, and the sort of the, the budget that I had in mind for, um, for building a home was maybe half that or less. <laughs> Our function as building uh, inspectors uh, is to enforce the codes. Um, now interestingly, the codes don't specifically tell us or direct us how to enforce the codes, right? So we've worked with a few public officials in our time to do projects and uh, in every single case, every case, they have said to us, well this part of the project or this entire project, we won't be getting a permit for it. And I just find it very interesting um, that officials who will make a career out of enforcing rules that then other people have to have to meet, people who might not have enough money or who might not have enough knowledge are forced to find the money to pay the specialists to do this very energy intensive stuff. These officials who make a living and even get a pension off of making other people follow the rules themselves choose to not follow the rules when they can get away with it. You know, and as I'm listening to them tell me why to justify it, they want to skip the cost, they want to skip the hassle, and they feel like they understand enough to authorize themselves to make choices. So that's how everyone feels, even the officials who will get away with it when they can. I just find that both, like I celebrate their self-authorization, but I'm also disgusted that they would make a life out of forcing people to follow rules that they themselves choose to skirt. It's, uh, it's, it reveals something about the context that we're in. The building officials that are paying attention to the state of the world and they're looking for more holistic solutions. They're wanting to push the boundaries. They're not wanting to, people to work too hard to meet the rules, but make the rules more accessible. Those are the ones that I appreciate the most. Well, I had the idea that since permitting was expensive and difficult, I would build one uh, without getting a permit. I got architectural review from my community and I would live in it long enough to see if it's something I actually wanted to do. Uh, as part of doing some legal work for sharing wood, one of the mediators in Snohomish County tipped me off to the agricultural structure size um, so that technically you wouldn't have to be permitted. It's a real misuse of the law uh, because anything for human use uh, is required to be permitted. 
So uh, it was actually kind of a funny thing. We did it, and then a building inspector showed up because they were coming to do a, a, a certificate of occupancy for another homeowner here. And when they looked in and saw the house, they said to a neighbor, what's this? And the neighbor said, it's an agricultural structure. And he said, well, do you re we really think that the cows and sheep need velvet couches and curtains? So I got a phone call from my community that there was an official letter on my door from uh, Snohomish County telling me that I had to either permit the structure or tear it down and telling me how much money I would be fined daily until that was done. So one of our builders here in the community that built a lot of the houses did a primitive set of drawings and we started our way through the building process to get everything up to code. And I have to say, they were fabulous. They worked with me. They gave me several extensions. I mean, as long as I was responsive and timely and I showed that it was my intention to work with them, they worked with me. There's a lot of distrust uh, on both sides of the counter, as we say. So it's very common, uh, whether it's a natural builder or just a builder, to have distrust for you know local government building departments. Um, and it, conversely, it's very common to, for local building inspectors, plans examiners, and so forth, to distrust um, the construction community. Now, the reasons being is because there's a general distrust of government pretty much across the board, which I totally understand and empathize with. Um, and uh, from the perspective of local government looking out to the community, there is a common perception that um, you know people will cut corners, you know, because they're profit motivated. And so I think that the the stage is really isn't set to facilitate or support you know, kind of trust and collaboration between these two groups. If you can create a relationship of trust with your inspector, it goes a long way. If you can build that relationship with even the whole building department, it's amazing how that will help you along the way. Um, not just because they assume you're doing good work and so maybe they don't spend an hour on the job site, maybe they spend five minutes and they're off and on, on to the next site so you can start working quicker, which keeps your timeline going. But um, also they're willing to trust you that you're doing a good job. There was a time um, when a, a building official showed remarkable uh, compassion and, and uh, flexibility. We were working with one on a house project um, where the client had run out of money and they were a week away from finishing their plumbing and electrical work and there was a few things left to close up in the house and the client just as the inspector was there on the site he approached the inspector and he said look I don't have I, I've run out of money to pay for a place to live while my house is being constructed would you mind signing off and just giving me a certificate of occupancy because I'll have nowhere to be and the building inspector said you know what we've you've worked so you've been so responsive you've done everything so well and I absolutely trust you and he signed off on the occupancy permit and uh, said you know you won't you won't see me again you know unless you invite me to your house opening but I, I trust you to get this done and that was a beautiful, shining human moment, and I want nothing less of the building inspectors that I work with. That, that's the culture I want to live in. Probably the biggest thing to start with is to not approach it as an owner builder, even though you are an owner builder. So it would be more about showing up with um, a very good quality set of plans, um, presenting yourself professionally, those sorts of things. I think that most building inspectors, when they, when they see someone walk in who's got a napkin with a sketch on it, they're you know, what do I do with this? How can I, how can I possibly uh, give you a permit for this? Or just, it, it shows that you don't understand the process. Uh, and it is a process. So if, if your desire is to build something that's not in the code, it can be harder to deal with, with inspectors because they just don't understand, uh, they don't understand what you're talking about. 
Um, I've literally had inspectors say, wait, you, you want to build a house out of what? Uh, you know, he just, it didn't compute at all. Before you even try to get your permit, go in and say, what is the process about? Most uh, code places will have a breakdown on using an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that says you need to do this office first and then this office, and, and it walks you through the entire process. So get that piece of paper, discover what you need. Go to the jurisdictional office, bring some books, some pictures, a various other things. Try to get fairly normal looking ones uh, so you don't freak them out the first time. And just to ask questions to see what their major concerns are. And to find out what are the applicable laws and regulations that you would have to follow. I think there's something about um, showing an interest and, and wanting to learn from the building inspectors that I think all the way through the process, that's, that's a very valuable tool that you can bring to the table is to say, I don't understand what that means, can you explain that a different way because I want to make sure we're on the same page. Um, you know, being respectful and, and wanting to learn something new I think is something that, that most inspectors appreciate. They, you know, they've worked hard to be where they are and I think a lot of people just because they have the word inspector, a lot of people automatically are thinking it's going to be a horrible experience. They're going to say no, they're going to be rude, they're going to be mean, and those inspectors are out there. There are inspectors like that, but they're not all like that. People often go into the building department with a confrontational attitude, and even if there weren't enemies there, you'll find them pretty quickly, you know, if you, if you approach that way. Um, and people, um, don't like to feel like they don't know something that they should know and so um, many people in the natural building world um, advise taking an educational approach to the building department and so there are a lot of people that are not confrontational about that but there are a few that are and I think it's made um, the route more difficult for other people to work collaboratively with building departments. If you can have the, the inspector realize that what they're learning from this is a piece of information that's going to benefit them in the long run, that I'm not the only person who wants to build with, with straw or cob. I'm not the only one in, in, in the county. There's this person, there's that person who are talking about it. And you're going to see more of this. So if, and, and nationally that's true, and, and internationally that's true. So if you can be on the cutting edge of that as an inspector, that's going to be, that's going to benefit you as well. You have to, be humble, uh, respect their knowledge, respect their opinions, because they do have power over you. I think the attitude of the customer, the builder, on the site uh, during that interaction is critical for determining the, uh, the nature of the relationship. And again, it's, you, you have to remember the, the building inspector uh, builder relationship is not an even relationship. It's a relationship where there is uneven levels of power. Ultimately, the inspector is pretty much in control, and they know that. Uh, they can red tag your job at any time, as long as they have a reason to do it. So you have to find a way to acknowledge that, accept that, be able to push so you're in control, and then let them have the control back. So it's, it's a dance that you really have to play. Speaking their language is going to be very important. Um, not only because uh, they'll understand you better, but again it shows that you've made an effort to to learn about what you're actually doing. You're not coming into this project blind. So, so we can, you know, right off the bat start to communicate at the code level, which is what we're bound with here, and unfortunately it's what we impose <laughs> on you then immediately we're going to see you more as a peer, right? And what we find is that um, even licensed design professionals are, are more often than not, not up to that level that we are. And I don't fault them for it. I understand it. You know, building code isn't written to be very understandable. I mean, you, you start reading the stuff and you, you, like when I started, I was, you know, you'd just read, you'd scratch your head and it referenced this other number in this other table. But until you actually went and looked at that other number, other table, like you couldn't really understand what the rest of the paragraph was saying. It's a mess. Over and over again, I'll see officials sitting around the table actually schooling each other or disagreeing about certain, certain um, details because 
The body of information is so enormous that nobody can navigate it all. The building inspector is generally there to help. And if they're a good inspector, it's a great thing. You have an extra set of eyes, you have somebody who can, you know, it's like you watch your kids grow, you don't notice them grow, and then someone comes along and goes, wow, you've grown. That's the inspector who can see something that we miss. Uh, and I, I actually really appreciate having them around. Codes were originally developed to protect homeowners and buyers and people from unscrupulous builders. I was on a job site one time and the plumbing inspector showed up and asked the homeowner something. And suddenly there was these two egos bumping heads against each other and the homeowner kind of got in the inspector's face and the inspector almost immediately said, well, where does that water line go? And uh, he said, none of your business, uh, which is possibly the worst thing you can say to an inspector. So the inspector said, well, actually, that's my job. That is my business. And he got up and he followed the water line and it went down to the other side of the property, which the inspector didn't even know existed when he showed up. And all the inspections that he'd done, he never knew that that was there. When he got there, he found two or three totally illegal Cobb cottages and basically said uh, the job is shut down. He red tagged the, the straw bale house we were working on and said the entire property is basically on lockdown until this gets resolved. And resolving it at first looked like bulldozing the cob houses. And the homeowner was able to, to work their way through that. They had, a, you know, each of the little structures had a kitchen, so they had to take the kitchen out. They had to de deconstruct some of it. They were allowed to keep the structures as outbuildings. I would say that since we're all human, the impacts of first impressions are huge. They, in many ways, define the path forward in terms of how effective our communication is going to be because we all do that, with, you know, unknowingly, I think. Yeah, I mean, everybody has their own sort of approach to how to, how to get a good inspection. Um, one of the things that we always like to do was have the site, as we said, be clean and all of those things, but also have it be um, enjoyable for the inspector. Not so much that he or she hangs out for three hours, but that, that you know, they, they get an opportunity to, uh, to enjoy their time there. So if we had a morning inspection, we always made sure we had a hot pot of coffee on. Uh, we would have donuts, you know, something there, hey, you want, you want a donut when you show up? That's great. Um, if it's in the afternoon, same sort of thing, you can have you know, tea or whatever in the afternoon and something for the, for the inspector to snack on. They're typically going from house to house to house to house and they have their lunch in their little cooler and they sit in their car and they eat their lunch. So they're not getting a lot of, um, they're not getting a lot of love along the way. So I think if you can offer a little bit of that, that goes a long way. And again, it's just showing caring and that you, you know, you, you respect them as a person. So this idea that that you know we're inheriting from our parents and from, from our grandparents this cultural expectation that we can own our own houses which is actually further and further from the reality of most young people these days they're gonna have to go about it a different way they're gonna have to find a way of doing it with less money why do we have to go to the bank to get the loan to then you know be forever in debt just so that we can shelter ourselves the Cobb house kind of originated out of a desire um, to be living closer to the land and being able to eat off the land. Um, and so Tracy became quite interested in um, the possibilities of putting up a small structure there and take, um, I think it was a two week workshop. And so yeah, basically we just kind of started going for it. We essentially had just finished, completed the cob house. We put the plaster on, we put up the door, everything was sealed and done. And it was a few weeks after that, that uh, we, Nini, Tracy's grandmother, the property owner, received a letter in the mail that it was very short, it was brief. It said, um, it said you have 10 days to vacate all structures from the property. Otherwise the, the landowner is subject to a $10,000 fine and 90 days in jail. Essentially someone, um, someone in the community complained and and so they had to investigate the claim you know, so if somebody else like a neighbor complained well you know so so and so was building what looks like a house right 
but I don't see any inspectors there, so it looks like it's built without a permit. Well, we have no choice, and we have to go look at it. So. It was a pretty hard blow. Here is the city just kind of cracking down upon our ability to have a wholesome life in the city. Pretty disheartening. Fundamentally, I think code is, is, is like the premise that having some sort of minimum requirement for safety, that's, that's a really solid premise. I can get behind that. In practice, it doesn't work very well. And so any system that becomes so complicated that people choose to just check out from it is a system that has some flaws. But the thing is, it's becoming so utterly complex that every single rule comes with a carbon impact that, you, that has not been calculated and can never be calculated. Like in order for me to meet that code, I have to have officials involved and lawyers involved and communication systems installed that I've never even seen before to manage this system. And, you know, all of which is beside the main point, which is I never agreed to any of this, you know? It's like we've gotten to a point where we can't trust common sense. For some reason, like, common sense doesn't stand up in court. But because of the way society works, that um, if you have a number on a piece of paper, that will stand up in court. Could be the wrong number, but <laughs> you know, it's okay. The court's gonna understand it because it's the number. You can't, you like walk in and you're not just saying like, Look, it's, it's gonna work because these are, this is a simple material, this is a simple method. I think civil disobedience is a, reasonable, is a reasonable approach and a reasonable solution. You know, if enough people create enough pressure that it, it would be necessary to create openings in the system that don't exist yet. Actually, the counties in California that have owner builder permits have them because of civil disobedience, have them because in the 60s and 70s, lots of people built their own houses without getting permits. Enough people that the county governments decided to deal with them collectively rather than individually. It should never stop us from doing what needs to be done. And um, I think that there is a good way to go about it in, in any different circumstance, and it would be different for every different circumstance. I've done a lot of in-town buildings on little ranches or backyards, and as long as the neighbors are amenable, and I, I really think it's important to stay in contact with your neighbors so you're not fearing that aspect, and you're not running heavy machinery and this sweet, gentle little pop of a building comes up in your backyard. It gives people a touchstone to see and to visit and to understand what the material is about. And also to say, it's not ugly, it's lovely. It's a little jewel back there. I want one. <laughs> the American Revolution had to do with the fact that we were being taxed without consent. And now here we find ourselves in a paradigm that is woven together or compartmentalized in a way that has nothing to do with consent. I want to be able to repurpose some old windows and gather together some basic materials and make myself some habitat. So I sort of went for sort of an alternative vision where I went and built without a permit in the countryside. The materials cost for the home was $10,000, $12,000 and I ended up with a really beautiful home. And I was, you know, I built on friends' property and we traded the home and, and work on their property for rent. So I went from paying a mortgage and living in the city to being like mortgage free and living in a beautiful home of my own creation. Pretty good deal. <laughs> <laughs> the work at Cal Earth and my father's work throughout his life was, was so much more than just about building. It was, it was about finding solutions, you know, about sort of how do, what is the sustainable solution to human shelter, that, that shelter is a basic human right, and why is it that there's nearly a billion people in the world who don't have adequate housing? 
the earth is an abundance and it is a solution and if we can add this to the types of building that's happening throughout the world you know it opens up this entire new way of building and sheltering people that they can actually do for themselves all over the world for millennia people have built safe and durable homes using materials harvested locally no toxic or expensive materials produced in belching factories or transported for miles using up scarce resources no building codes or mortgages and just like the solutions possible in the Western world when these small green buildings return to Mother Earth their small footprint will leave little to no trace.